This is a video that I've wanted to do for some time. Um, it's going to be called In Focus, and it will be a sort of in-depth analysis of Panzer III tracks. I will look at some actual examples that I own, and then we'll look at the scale depictions of those. So if anyone wants to just know about the tracks and not modeling, they don't have to watch the whole thing. We'll do the real stuff first and the scale stuff after that. I will be using the terminologies um, sort of developed by Dr. Peter Schwarzman, and I'll rely pretty heavily on what he's written in this book. My friend Hamilker Barkas did a review of this book over on his channel. You should check it out. He actually speaks German fluently, which helps him understand it quite a bit better than me, and I've actually discussed some of the things that I have, have seen in here. I have to get it either translated by Google or do my best to understand what I'm reading, which can be pretty difficult. It, regardless though, is still worth owning, even if you speak no German, just the... Some of these diagrams are very, very easy to understand. There are 13 standard types of Panzer III tracks. I don't think most people understand that. And many of them are very, very similar, and a few are just absolutely incompatible with the others. So this is a Type One. This would be the first type of Panzer III track that was ever manufactured. Now this is actually the second um, iteration of that, in that it had a slightly taller guide horn, but this is the the first type of Panzer III track link. It's actually very reminiscent, by the way, of a Panzer IId track link, which looks a lot like this, I think a little thinner and a little bit more squat this way, but the features are nearly identical. So how you identify a Type I uh, is, firstly, you'll notice that we have a completely flat surface that touches the ground. So in any other type of Panzer III track, you're going to have some kind of detail here, but here we just have it flat. We have much thinner than we're used to seeing of these little areas here. So this whole section in the middle is quite thin. You also only have just a single piece of metal connecting where the pin goes to where the other pin would go and where the ground surface would be touching. So we have a hollow guide horn, which if you have never been around real track links, is not only hollow this way, but it's also hollow inside of here. There's a bit of space in there. It appears we do have a casting mark in here, but it is quite difficult to read. I've also got quite a bit of just kind of chunky rust in here. I haven't had any of my track length sandblasted, so they're they're all in the condition that they came from Russia or Latvia. So they're they're a little rough at times. I, I actually like the look of them this way. So a common misconception about Panzer III tracks is that you have two types. You have the, the smaller, the thinner this way, and the wider. The misconception is that the wider type are known as 40 centimeter, and these are either called 36s, which is correct, or called 38s. So to dispel that myth, and this is another Schwarzman bombshell, this is 36 centimeters wide, if you measure from here to here. Every type after that is 38 centimeters wide. There were no 40 centimeter Panzer III tracks. That's a misnomer. That may have been a measurement from the pin head to the outside of the pin, but it's 36 and 38, and that's it. The Type II differed from this in that it was a near duplicate of this, but they widened it to 38 centimeters and introduced two little insets right here that are on many, many tracks, including early Panther and Tiger tracks, to sort of insets that break up this face here to make it more grippy. And then they also introduced these little insets over on the sides here. Apart from that, they look very, very similar. So if you ever see earlier war stuff and, and you just see this here, that's either a Type I or Type II. Again, though, there are two types of Type 1 with either a very short guide horn that comes up to about here or this type. This is a Type 3, or more specifically, a Type 3A. Now, this particular example is um, broken, and it's one of two Type 3As that I have, but it's in far better condition as to how it was when it was made. So if you look, you can see very, very sharp details in this surface here and in these little insets, which are rounded, by the way, which you normally can't tell. So, the main differences between this and the Type 1 and 2, again, it's 38 centimeters like the Type 2 was, but they have introduced these little inset holes here, these little oval-shaped holes on the sides, and you'll see these on nearly every Panzer III track link from here on forward. So I've zoomed in on some of the markings in between these areas here, and you can see that we just have some numbers there that looks like 2079. Over here we have a marking that just says 1942. Maybe something above it I can't quite make out. And then interestingly, we have a three in between the areas on the front of the track link, which I'm imagining these would get worn off pretty easily. So I didn't even know they did this until this one showed up. 
So you have markings like this on all Panzer III tracks, actually, and my Panther and other tracks as well. You'll see that we have casting seams in areas on the track. We also occasionally will get sort of just nubs like this here or like this. I imagine these are some kind of plug. They, they don't seem like any kind of weathering or wear. That seems to be natural. Any of the pitting you see here is probably just the aging of the steel. But things like that seam, I see these pretty regularly on track lengths that I have. Later in production, after the Type 3A, we got to the Type 3B. The only difference really in those is that you have a solid guide horn here. And that's, they're pretty much indistinguishable from each other apart from that. This is a different Type 3A that I have. This is known as a CKC, which is just collector talk for the particular type of stamp right there. There's another one I can't really read up there. In reference to where it was manufactured, you can see that this one probably sat outside for a lot longer. Anytime you get things like this, if it's this black, that means that it was probably found in a really, really rusty condition. And someone painted it black, so you can see the, like, the actual color of the steel in there. This guy is not broken, so he's completely intact, but he's in a lot rougher shape just all around. One thing that I think is interesting is just the overall wearing down of these sharp, proud faces and how they get lower down into where these insets are. And over time, I imagine these would just completely wear off. So after Type 3B, we get into Type 4. Now, Type 4 is a really rare type. There are a few for sale. Now, I do collect these things, but um, Type 4s run four or more times more expensive than the types that I buy. I can get mine pretty cheap because they were very, very common. The Type 4 had these really interesting support bars across the insets on the, the outward facing face and these two little holes on the part that contacts the ground. They're very distinctive and they're quite rare. Uh, I don't have one yet. I may at some point get one. You do see them on quite a few famous vehicles, um, like the, the Jagdpanzer IV, for instance. I have seen these types of tracks on. So after the Type 4, naturally, it would be the Type 5. Now, this is a Type 5A. Now, if you're paying attention, most of the time, a is in reference to a hollow guide horn. Not always. If that particular type was manufactured without a hollow guide horn, A could be the solid type. The thing that's interesting about the Type 5 is that it, it, it looks more like the Type 3, whereas the Type 4 had these anomalous changes, like these supports that ran across here and inset holes into the, the contact face as opposed to anything that popped out. Type 5 is nearly identical to Type 3, except we have these very iconic chevrons which were found on later types of Panther and Tiger, all of your classic late war tracks. Still, 38 centimeters as always, the exact same shapes, everything is exactly the same. If you look at these chevrons, they are very, very proud. They stick out quite a ways. Like, that's almost the width of my thumb. If I show you there, it's pretty easy to see. Or that way. They stick up quite a ways. Now, this particular example of a Type 5A was never used. Um, this was actually welded to a tank as add-on armor or as a spare. If you look up here, you can see what is aluminum or some kind of, of non-rusting metal. So why that is, is that it was tack welded to the hull with a, a, an easier weld, something that would hold but wouldn't be insurmountably difficult to just knock off the tank if they needed this as a spare. I'm assuming that's what uh, the guy that I got it from said as well as any research I could find. Now, I'd never seen a, a track link with this sort of odd, shiny welding material on it. But I talked to some guys who work with modern machinery like that, and they said it, 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 it makes sense. You could sort of just knock it off with your, your large hammer, and it would just give because the steel surfaces would be obviously stronger than that weld, so it would just pop off. So that's kind of an answer to a, an interesting question, which was I never really understood how you would get track links just sitting on the side of a hull. Are they hooked onto it somehow? Are they welded to it? If they're welded, how are they welded to it? It's strange that it's up here and not on these surfaces. It has made it a huge pain. I can't actually attach this to any other track links I have because this is in the way of where it would sit inside, so I could remove it if I wanted to, but it's kind of a neat piece, so I don't really want to. Apart from that, the Type 5A is very, very, very similar to the Type 3A. We have exactly the same sized everything. This is a Type 5B, so I hadn't had any other B variants in this video yet. 
that's what the guide horn looks like when it is solid. It is just solid, like you'd think it would be. It is hollow in here. Apart from that, again, these are very, very, very similar. A lot of these track types are the same. So here's an example of a, of a track length that was clearly worn on a vehicle, as opposed to that, the 5A that I just showed you. If you look at the face that contacts the ground, and this is very, very common amongst um, sort of relic or souvenir style track links. I've got a bit of a chevron here, even less of one here, an indistinguishable lump here, and then nothing here. So I don't know the way that the suspension wore, but if you look at it from this angle, you can see that this side of the part that impacts the ground is far wider. And as we move here, it gets very, very thin. And this is exactly how my shoes wear, like whatever part you're putting the most weight on which in this case was either the outer or inner surface of this tank over here, wore off way sooner. So sometimes when people talk about tracks being on a tank backwards, that's what they would do is they'd wear down one side just like tires and then flip them backwards because it really did have just about the same amount of uh, impact for traction. It wasn't a whole lot different. So you will see backwards tracks on tanks. Now, after the Type 5B would have been the Type 5C. Now, I don't have one of those. They're a little bit less common. They would be exactly like this, except they would have a small inset space in here. Just a little pinch, if you will, out of this. Which is actually the same way that the... There's a rare solid guide horn type panther track, which is the same way. It wasn't perfectly solid. It was mostly solid, like a little inset. King Tiger track links have the same thing. So that was the third variant of Type 5. Type 5s are pretty common. So after the Type 5, we have the Type 6, and the Type 6, of which there are two variants, look like this, basically, uh, if you were to pinch this face right here and have it come in in a little area like that, just below these two insets. Apart from that, the Type 6A looks identical to a Type 5. So again, chevrons, very, very similar layout, and then it just kind of pinches in here. Here's a picture of one. The Type 6B, again, is exactly the same, except for the fact that we have that inset in the guide horn. After that, we have the Type 7. Now, the Type 7 is a, a very, very strange track link. So we have a somewhat similar setup, except the middle of these three areas where the pin goes through is very, very wide. We then have some strange supports here in, right underneath it, and then we have holes in the contact face as well as some odd molding that we don't see on any other track link. The Type 7 is only meant to be used with Osket, and so it's actually not compatible with this type of track link. Because this thing is so much wider on that track, it wouldn't be able to be connected to this type of track. I've never seen them connected to Oskatten, but the slightly wider middle section was only seen on Oskatten and Type 7. The last two types of track are Winter Ketten and Ausketten. Now there's some, actually some misconceptions about these as well. So a Winter Ketten is essentially a duck build type six. So even in documentaries that I've seen, people tend to call any tracks in the East, either East tracks or winter tracks. So they don't really seem to understand that they were two completely different tracks. So if we use my type five here, as though it was a type six, now these would be handed, but if this were winter ketten, it would simply have a duck bill, like a large metal piece that comes off the side here, which were e very easily broken off, which you'll hear people say in, in books or documentaries and stuff. They, they didn't hold up very well. That's true. That's why they developed Ostketten. Winter ketten was in 42. Ostketten was in 44. They're very, very different types of tracks. Ostketta are, as I said, basically type sevens, but they now have what I guess with the best way to describe it would be in the style of Tiger One. They have a fully extended section that comes out, which the wheel and guide horn system is right underneath the wheel, but the rest of the track is not just this thin metal thing. It's a whole different section of track. So the pin then extends an extra one of these out here. So they're actually quite wide. Now, normally these tracks are 38 centimeters. The duckbill on a winter cat and goes out to about 55, so that's quite far. And then an Osketten is 56 centimeters wide. I have a Panther track link that's 66 centimeters wide. So this thing's only 10 centimeters shy of a Panther track link. They're very, very large. And then again, I would have another one of these that would come all the way out here. So let's use my 3A to talk about some accessories. Now on the east, 
not just um, Winter Kata and Os Kata. Those were not the only things they tried to do to increase the efficiency of tracks. So in Type 3, when they added these little insets here, these were for something called Hammerstolen. What Hammerstolen is, is this. It is just a cast tooth that fits into that shape with a little rounded sort of oval shape and a hole. So you take your hammer stolen and you just insert them into these holes. And then you have a much more aggressive sort of gripping for ice or slippery conditions. And if we look at it from the side, it sticks out like this, so it's that much farther because this Type 3 is actually in basically new condition as far as how far that sticks out. So the hammer stolen would stick out quite a bit farther and would give you a lot better grip. Now how do you get them to stay there? Because they just slide in and out like this. Well, that is the first of many uses that you have on track lengths of something called a cotter pin. So you would just put them in, stick that sort of split pin, which is like this, through here, and then, you know, part it and wrap it back around. You can see a good example of this on German tool clamps. So these would be the types of pins, and obviously in a larger scale, that you would see holding actually track lengths together and holding something like this in. So it's a split pin up here, they push it through, and then they bend it back around that way. I don't see photographs of these very often, but um, they do make the tracks look pretty intimidating. Besides Hammerstollen, we have something called Mittelstollen, which are colloquially called um, ice grifers amongst most uh, tank people. Uh, I don't know that until Schwarzman wrote that book that, that I had any idea what they were called, so I'm, I'm really, really into that book. So this is your mid-late uh, Mittelstollen, and the earlier type would look exactly like this, except it would be missing this area here, sort of just this. It's a square if you look at it, and then it has these really beefy teeth that come out and then a kind of support here, then this two things here. So the earlier type, again, looks just like this. If you look at it, it's a very strange shape. Obviously, um, mostly one big cast piece of s steel, but with this sort of strange hook shape here. And then this. Now this is actually spring-loaded originally. So mine has seized and I sort of got it to give way. So this is the sort of button on the bottom of the Mittelstollen. And when it was originally in use, you could just push this up and it would be, you could lock it into place and then it would spring back down. Here's what the inside, as far as I can see, looks like. Now you can see I've got a pretty rusted, seized up spring on that side. So right now it just sort of freely moves. Which is actually, um, in my opinion, for one that's not working, a better scenario than having it jammed. But you can see that spring in there. And then there's one on the other side, I don't know if it's picking up, there it is. That one I've had a piece fall out of this on. But so this is another separate piece of steel. It's strange because when you move it, it sounds like a rock. And originally this would have been spring-loaded, the same on other types of these. So you then take this thing and you would take the hook here and you feed it up inside this hole. So you point it like this and then come down below. Now this being spring-loaded, you would have had to push up. Mine's a little easier to do. Then when you get it in, you release it, and it stays there. So there's no cotter pin or anything to hold this puppy in. So mine being um, not in original shape, I mean, because there's kind of some play in this one. I don't. He's in a, a pretty rough shape compared to some of my other stuff. But as far as I can tell, that's it. That's how it would stay there. So you have a spring loaded, and you saw the size of those springs. They're not very large, so I'm not really sure how that would stay in a tank. But if we turn it to the side, you can see that with a combination of Mitchell and Hammerstollen, you have just about the same distance from the original um, contact area. So it would stick out and basically be like wearing cleated shoes. That's a, nearly a completely different track. So one thing we haven't talked about is pins and how to pin them together. So I have a few pins. This is one of my, my better examples. Uh, quite mangled up here on top, but in relatively good condition. It has been painted, of course. Here's an example of a slightly more interesting one because it has this stamp on the head, although it's in quite rough shape. One thing you'll notice is that this good condition pin here has a hole through it, whereas this sort of rustier version, it's the pin that goes through it was actually sort of corroded and rusted in there. 
So, to pin together tracks, it's as simple as you'd think it would be. You just shove the pin in one side and flip it through to the other side. The side that comes through the other side, so we have the pin flush with one side. Now this side sticks out a bit past the other end, which is this would be the measurement that would probably measure 40 centimeters. Here again we have a cotter pin that would go through, just like on the hammer stolen, except of a larger scale, obviously get pushed through one side, bent around, and that's how you put the tracks on the tank. Interestingly, you can see a stamp here, and I have that in these areas, like on each side of this track here as well. And that seems to be a pretty common place to put stamps. Some of mine survive better than others, of course. These are all the tracks I have that'll go together. You can see that the colors are very different depending on uh, how they were treated once they were recovered or how they've been stored. This one is just straight, you know, field rusty. This guy looks like he was in some wet ground, perhaps. These two were very rusty and then just painted black. One thing you'll notice is that you do see bits of reflection or, or, or high specular values, like here and on any of them that I, I frequently mess around with, you'll get very, very scraped off and perfectly shiny areas very quickly. So that really does happen. Even when it was just sort of painted, uh, the chevrons will become shiny if you just bump it around on stuff. Again, to further illustrate, this being the type one, if I try to line these up, you can see that this just about lines up, but these nowhere near line up. So these 36 centimeter tracks are not compatible with these in any way. So I'm back over by the bench. You can see the damage that these actual track links have done to my cutting mat. That's pretty fun. And we will look at Dragon and Kaizen and Tamiya's interpretations of some of these track types just to see how sort of true they are to the real thing and how varied they even are as companies. Because I think a lot of a lot of model kits don't really understand the complexity. Now, I didn't even get into the different types of vehicles that are that those track links were used on because primarily they were used, you know, all over the place. But certain ones, like you'll see rarer ones on uh, Yeg Panzer IV or Brumbear, some of those later Panzer IV type variants. You'll see stuff like Type Sixes or even Type Sevens. So uh, sometimes the kits do come with the right tracks, and a lot of times they don't. So let's check Dragons first. So this is Dragons Type One. And it seems pretty good. Now it has the pin molded in, which is strange for me now that I've gotten to know these tracks relatively well, having to look at them every day when I leave for work. Uh, it does seem to be about correct. It's got the large, you know, contact point there. It's got the little, they do have little insets that go down. They don't sh uh, shoot in, but they do go down like right there. So it looks pretty correct. So I gotta give it to Dragon for that. They have, I think, I don't know if that guide horn is really um, which type it would be of the two, but it, it seems okay. It's certainly not anything I would complain about in scale. Uh, relatively nicely done. So I don't have any type 2s, the same with my real tracks, but here we have a type 3A. You can see we have the insets here. Now this is the majority of magic tracks that people have, and I have tons, because people have been kind enough to send them to me and stuff. So I get people spares when they use different types of tracks, but so I have tons of magic tracks and the majority of them are type 3 A's. So here you see the little insets in the front. You've got the hammer stolen holes, but although we don't have any hammer stolen to put in them, um, it's not quite, you know, accurate with the, the horns being hollowed in that way, but that'd be really hard to do in scale. So these do seem, as far as 35th is concerned, like a relatively, you know, a really, really good interpretation of that type of track link. So here we have a Type 5B, which is one of the ones I played around with the most. Um, you will notice if you look right at the front of it and that that whole thing, let me try to get it in shot there correctly, that should all be hollow inside where that, that guide horn is. So they just put like a little inset, and I understand that because to hollow out that guide horn would have been like impossible. So there is a slight inaccuracy with that. Now you'd think maybe I'm I'm nitpicking, but it does actually affect the overall look of the track as opposed to what a real one looks like if you don't have uh, Mitchell Stolen covering it up. Still pretty good. I mean, the fidelity in there is crazy. Those cleats look about exactly to scale and they're very, very well done, or the, the chevrons here. And then that guide horn does look pretty much right from the outside. So I was surprised, because I looked around in my Magic Tracks dash, 
and found a Type 7, which I think was with my um, Jagdpanzer IV, like the early production with Zimmerit. So you can see we've got the wider of the three things on top. Let me bring in another type so you can see it for reference. So you can see here you have three almost evenly sized things, and then this one has that big fat one in the middle, which is what makes them incompatible with um, other types of Panzer III tracks other than um, Osketen. But, you know, again, it's, it's pretty good. It's got all that detail in there. That's a very accurate, apart from, again, you don't have a hole where the, the guide horn is hollow, but you just couldn't do it in that scale. So I think they've done as good of a job as you possibly can, frankly. Dragon has made Mittelstollen of the early type, which you then just glue on to the front face of the track. So it has that little indent there, and that can sit inside the track. So that's pretty cool. But you can see that that's the type that just has the little the lines that go down. It doesn't have the squared off edge. But very nice touch that they've actually made. Um, Mitchell Stolen in 35th scale. They seem pretty accurate, to be honest with you. Uh, the last different one from Dragon I have to look at would be Winter Ketten. And again, so these are sort of Type 6 adjacent because they have the, the chevrons in the front. And then here you can see the little squeezed two areas here. And then... So you've got the hollow, or the, so you've got the solid horn and chevron. So it's kind of like a Type 6 with that little extension. Here you can see that it only has that little rib to support it, so these did snap off quite a bit. Um, you see a lot of broken ones for sale, actually. But uh, again, as far as the detail goes, so they, they can replicate the Type 6 indents. You can see right there, they actually go underneath. It's very good. So we can jump straight from that one to Kaizen, which has not put the the chevrons on. So it looks like a Type 6 that's worn down, frankly. Apart from that, the detail is very good. They've actually hollowed out the, the guide horn. That's really impressive. I was not aware of that. I have seen Winter Ketten on all types of, of tracks, at least a handful. So I've seen chevrons, no chevrons. I've seen slight variations in Winter Ketten. So um, as far as I know, that is still accurate. Because you'll see even like a Type 3 Winter Ketten like this. So Very nice. I mean, actually better than Dragons because... Uh, let me bring it in. So you can see there's a difference in what the inside of that guide horn looks like. So these are Kaizen's Type 3 uh, A's. So here you've got that. Let me pull the pin on one. It looks like he actually has it hollow inside the horn as well. I wasn't aware of this. I never really looked at these this closely before. It appears that Kaizen does a few things that Dragon can't quite do. His injection molding quality is crazy good. And I, I've thought that since I first saw them. For a small run, you know, like aftermarket company, this in injection molding, that's really, really nice. I, I work in miniatures myself, and that's really impressive. Uh, so I would have to go with these on accuracy as well. Very good. This is the Kaizen um, Oskete. I, I haven't even cleaned it up, I just nipped it off. Um, the details on there do look very good. Now his horn isn't as hollow on that one, I wonder why. Still, it's somewhere in between the way that um, Dragon does it. But here you can see that you have the 1, 2, 3, normal Panzer III track, like if you put your finger over it there. That's like a Type 5 almost, you know. And then here you have this, another attachment. And it starts to take on the look of a Tiger One link just by how wide it is. It's it's a very cool looking track link, to be honest. And it makes any kind of late war like Panzer IV or Stug IV look really, really beefy. Um, they do have, there's that, that type of guide horn with like the inset in there. I haven't seen that on any Dragon ones. I thought I had some. I think they have done it. So that's that's relatively nice. So now we find ourselves looking at DS. Love it or hate it, there it is. 
So as a 3A, the insets are very, very sharp. The holes for the hammer stolen are actual holes. The guide horns uh, are again hollow here, but not hollow up inside of there, but you wouldn't expect them to do that. You know, it's, it's actually really, really good for band tracks. When they're painted, those details pop a little better. It's actually kind of hard to see, but that seems about scale accurate. You know, the only concern would be that, you know, if, if, if they actually bend, but they seem to look okay. Again, I mean, it's, it's pretty well known that I'm not a fan of them, but they're all right. Now, one of my problems with these, though, is this seems to be the only type that I've ever seen. I've seen uh, Type 1, and I've seen these. Tamiya. Um, I don't keep a lot of Tamiya in the house, so I actually, unfortunately, didn't have any unused Tamiya Panzer III tracks to look at. I have one set that is on my Stug. And I'd rather not rip them off, if that's okay with you guys. So I'm just going to zoom in on some of these details. They are already painted, so it'll be a little bit difficult, but let's see what we can see. The insets seem very detailed, uh, crisp enough for my taste. And so if you look at these tracks, don't mind my spot where they were glued together, one would think Type 3B. So a couple of years ago I would have said, well, Tamiya doesn't have hollow guide horns, that's no good. These type of tracks did exist, they're called Type 3B. But were they common on Stug 3B? No, because Type 3As were far more common. Type 3Bs are actually pretty rare, I've never even seen one for sale. Um, and I, I look at that stuff quite a bit, so... You can get away with it, sure. Um, it's definitely plausible, so I don't have a problem with it. And I also don't particularly have a problem if you have your tracks roughly this tight. I've seen it on, on Stugs, so it's not completely unrealistic. Uh, Tamiya's tracks do seem all right, although because of the limitations of their their molding, they're a very rare type. And again, if we're looking at how tracks sit and, and are represented, so here is a dragon review I did for Armorama quite some time ago. This would be the early Sturmpanzer IV, known to most of us as Brumbear. And I can't see a lot of the track sag through there, but you can see that there really isn't any. These are actually kind of loose. Um, but they look perfectly fine if, if you're going to hide it with shirts, and I think. And that's that's something we should address, is that I get a lot of flack for being so anti-DS, and I really don't like DS, but in a case like this, I don't really care. The thing I do care about is if you look at them, you'll see that they're Type 3As. Type 3As are super common, so could you see them on a Brumbear? Sure. But most of the pictures that I've seen, they'll have a couple of the later kind of stranger variants on these vehicles. Um, at least from what I've seen. Now, if you have evidence to the contrary, um, I'd be more than willing to accept it. But what I've seen, um, 3As don't really seem right. They seem like, all right, fine, it's plausible. But it's strange that, again, Dragon threw these in because I think they frankly just have a good set of 3As. 5Bs may even be more accurate, but I've never seen solid Guidehorn 5Bs from Dragon and DS. So it's, it's interesting that once they made the switch to DS, their tracks got kind of simplified. Here, of course, is Magic Tracks on the first Dragon model I ever built, the Panzer 3J Initial, which I never even painted the interior on. Just kind of rattle candy gray and called it. Still a great experience, but... Um, and I borrowed the track sag method from my buddy Hamilcar, and it does look pretty beefy and pretty real. And again, these are their standard 3As that are very, very common, and they look very good. If I have these two builds sitting next to each other, this guy looks a little more impressive than this guy. Now the detail on each one seems adequate, but this one does sit better. Now this one's interesting because these are workable Kaizen, and actually I think I may have not quite put enough in. Although if you look at period pictures, this may actually be the most accurate uh, as far as sag is concerned because it's just subtle. Very, very subtle. You see how it sits like that? This side sits... Like, again, I kind of got to push them around to make them do anything because they get kind of tight. But that's a more subtle track sag. It doesn't, like, hit you over the head with it. Like, this is a little bit too tight. This seems like kind of an artistic... Thing. You, like, you overdo it just to make sure people understand that it's there. Uh, something like that might be accurate. And, and free wheels can do this, and any kind of workable could do that. Magic Tracks could do that. Frankly, I just put so many on here because, again, that was my first time doing Indie Links, and I just wanted to see if I could do it, and it was cool. But as a piece with Indie Tracks that have really nice detail, 
actually this is a model that I had 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 given terrible review scores to and once it got decent tracks on it um, I actually kind of like it so getting decent indie link tracks in my opinion is important I know that again I don't mind if people use DS certainly uh, I just personally don't like it but I do think that it, it's representative of like if you look at here actual Panzer three track links stop very rigidly like chunk 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 and the fact that these tracks can do this is kind of um, a problem for me personally. I, I prefer that they are a little bit more like miniature replica tracks. So these guys here stop exactly. Like that's as close as I can push them before they break. And that's how it should be. So Magic Tracks are the same way. Uh, Model Casting will be the same way. So um, I guess I'm just kind of pointing out that I prefer Indie Links because they behave and look a little bit better. So that's my video. Um, if you ever wanted to see what a 35th scale Panzer III track link looks like next to a real one, that's 35th, and that's obviously real. Uh, this is a series of videos I wanted to do for a long time. Um, I'm very passionate about the history, period. And I do models because I love the real things, and then I was able to get a hold of some of the real things, and it's its, its own intoxicating hobby, just learning about the stuff. And, and hopefully, if you don't want to do this sort of thing, you don't want to buy chunks of tanks because your wife may divorce you, um, I'm, I'm very much enjoying sharing what I get with other people. And there'll be more videos in this series. Um, I've got a couple of different tools and all kinds of bits of, of panzers laying around that I'd, I'd like to just analyze, probably in much shorter videos, but it's cool to be able to show modelers what the real thing looks like.